He is absolutely trying to avoid the rain, but inevitably he must head towards it if he ever wants to get home, and he certainly does want to get home. Uh, these topi are at home, of course. They are not migrators. They live here permanently on the plains of the great Maasai Mara with not a care in the world but for being devoured by lions. And that must be a fairly substantial care, I suppose. But other than that, there's always food to eat, there's always a view to look at, there are always friends around, and there are always people watching you, wondering what it is that makes you so fascinating. So that is a group of topi. And then on those plains, way beyond there, there is nothing. Absolutely not a sausage. And they were covered a week ago in the black ant-like figures of the wildebeest. In fact, even less than a week ago, just a few days ago, Scott and I were trundling around there with two prides of lions as they hunted the wildebeest. And they are nowhere to be seen there anymore. Hello Riley, you're aged four and you ask a very good question and it's not a question that only four-year-olds ask, it's a question that sometimes even adults ask. And the question, Riley, you, that you've asked is, are lions mean? Well, Riley, no. Lions are not mean at all. Lions are predators. That means that they like to eat meat, and because they like to eat meat, they have to eat meat. They can't eat grass. They wouldn't survive if they ate grass. And because they eat meat, they have to kill some animals in order to survive. Now, it's not very different from, I'm sure, you eat meat sometimes. You get a little bit of beef or some mints or something like that in your supper, and that comes from an animal. And, of course, we're very thankful that we are able to to eat meat because it's very good for us sometimes. Not everybody eats meat, but most of us do. And so we're a little bit like the lions. We're not mean, but sometimes it is a difficult thing, but sometimes we have to kill in order to eat. So, you know, it is difficult to watch things being killed by lions, but they don't do it because they're mean, they do it because they have to eat. And you will uh, think about things like that, and I hope you keep thinking about them as you get older, and uh, your view will change uh, as you get older on what you think is mean, and what you think is okay, and what you think it isn't. And uh, I think I'm going to leave your <laughs> mum and dad to discuss that subject with you from now. Good. Ooh. Nasty bit of thunder behind us. There's also a rainbow. Let's show them the rainbow. And just move slightly. There we are. I think we're going to get smashed by the storm. I keep saying that and then we don't get smashed, so I'm going to keep saying it in the hope that we won't get smashed. There we are. Isn't that pretty? Oh, we are being smashed already. Uh, Alice? Alice, we might have to have... We, we might have a bit of a problem shortly. Now, you can't ask Taylor for a link because Taylor is not live. I am live. Yes. We're going to get ourselves into a bit of trouble here, everybody. I think we're going to have to put down the covers. Let's just give it one minute because sometimes it's just a few little drops but I think that we're going to get smashed. This thing is coming straight towards us. Oh, but let's just look at the rainbow for as long as we can. It is very beautiful indeed. Isn't that lovely? Oh, and I can smell the rain coming up. You can feel the wind. It's just got cooler because of course it's carrying moisture. But the light is still absolutely gorgeous. Wow. Yeah, you can hear the wind coming in front of the storm. And perhaps also you can see that the topi have started to look a little bit uneasy. And I'm sure you're all very excited to see the rainbow. I'm not quite so excited because I think I'm about to get wet, but that's okay. It is just too beautiful. Wow. It's going all the way over the top of us. 
The topi are starting to move around now. They're a little bit nervous. Do you want me to try and move? I'm just going to do a, a, another little move around because the rainbow is actually complete. It goes all the way around us. It's even better. It's a double. It's a double rainbow. Now we're really going to get hit, Craig. <laughs> Thank you for the idea to turn. Isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> now we're getting wet. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I'm not sure where Scott is at the moment. I think he's underneath that mess. We might have to go to a technical loop if we all have to cover up everybody. And I do apologize for that in advance if it does actually occur. We'll wait out just a few drops that we have now. But I believe Scott is uh, going to talk to you from his tent. Let's head across to him. Hello everyone. And as you can see, we're just having to open up. We've got a little present for all of you, but it requires unwrapping. So give me a second. We've positioned ourselves in a way that the rain is not going to affect us too much, hopefully. I just need to tuck these in, voila. And then, Manu can do his work. Good to have you back on board. These cheetah are soaked. We've just managed to catch up with them. We were putting all of our flaps down and we're incredibly happy to find them close by. They hadn't moved far. And these two boys are looking a little bit miserable. How cool is this? I'm so, so happy to be able to be sharing these moments with you because so often we don't get to show you anything when it's raining. But now we can. They are going to pop out of our open window fairly shortly, but we'll reposition accordingly. And thankfully the direction they're heading in actually suits us because the rain is coming from their tail towards their head. Well, that does appear different in that picture. Maybe the wind's changed. The wind makes it a bit tricky for us when it's rainy because, of course, the wind gets blown in from the side, but it can also help us. And it's been quite a constant, steady downpour. Oh, here it's getting stronger. How epic! Now, I'm sure a lot of you have always wondered what it's like or what the animals get up to when it's raining, and this is the answer. They just sit and wait it out. There's no point hiding under a bush. It's not going to help much. Ah, oh, Beard, you mentioning that your cubs or kittens, I guess your house cats, wouldn't like this, and I'm sure they wouldn't. I'm just have, having to do some running repairs and maintenance here on the old roof. If I hold it out at a bit of an angle, at least the water dripping off the plastic cover on top will keep it off the car. Stunning views. And for now we are lucky. Hello to Krista, you'd like to know if the cheetah will often use rain as a advantageous environment for them to hunt in and yes a lot of the predators will use rainy conditions to hunt in but I've never been lucky enough to follow cheetah in the rain okay so I'm glad you saw that it indicates that we're in a bit of a state here but I'm glad we got to show you those few shots of them the rain is getting a bit harder oh the cheetah are moving towards us she's moving quite insistently I wonder if she's seen something. I can't, I can't not take you with now. I'm gonna try my best to make a plan to keep us with these cheetah, but we do need to make sure we keep our equipment dry. We've got lots of fancy gear on this vehicle that helps get the broadcast to you. I'm gonna close up this latch. Thank <laughs> you. 
while we all get ready guys because I'm battling to keep you guys entertained um, is actually Manu's done well we can actually stay here don't go anywhere Manu's made a plan I'm gonna jump in and get involved here and help out there we go voila the next window is open <laughs> okay well the good news is I can't see any suitable prey for her all I can see are a few topi as you can see there's lots of vehicles out here enjoying the sighting with us they and their proper cars are probably having a good chuckle at us now <laughs> but this is all absolutely worth all the jumping to try and keep ourselves dry good so I wonder what they're going to do next. George, you would like to know if the cheetah would ever jump into the jeep or onto the jeep. And no, it's highly unlikely that normal cheetah would. However, this individual, the mother, actually does. Her name is Malaika and she's got a bit of a reputation for jumping onto the hoods of vehicles and even sometimes the roofs. And it's something that I personally don't think should be tolerated by guides. Of course, it's everybody's dream to have a cheetah jump onto the roof of their car right next to your head as you have poke your head out the sunroof. But of course, it's not really good for, for wild animals to be getting that close to us, especially when they are in the wild. Even though cheetah's got no no real threats to us it could just have be having a bad hair day and what happens if it attacked somebody or even just scratched somebody on the face it wouldn't be very good so it is something she does but it's not something that I really approve of so if I ever saw coming up to the hood of this vehicle I'd make sure to chase her off because there is a line that needs to be drawn somewhere in the sand or in today's context the mud let's take a look they're moving off again oh the vehicle's just driven to a hole nearby, so you may hear a bit of revving as they try and get out. Hello, LK. You'd like to know if these animals will try and seek cover. And, I mean, there's just not much cover that's actually worth seeking. That is their problem. There's nowhere that they can go where they're going to be dry now. There's no caves. So, that would be the only kind of natural dwelling that would keep them dry. What a scene this is, everyone three cheetah strolling through the Mara in the pouring rain. Absolutely epic. Yes, and Chris, you've just said that you wouldn't mind getting a little bit wet to be able to have the view that we have now, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's definitely worth getting wet. I'd be more than happy to be soaked drenched completely without a towel in order to be able to enjoy this and enjoy this with you guys alongside us now you can see the cheetah are a little bit nervous and I think it's because of the combination of the vehicles and the rain so there's just a lot of ambient noise and they're a little bit nervous due to that and even though they are not prey animals they have enemies of their own so they need to be very cautious and it's a good show that they will in fact need to be very very cautious of other predators okay I think we're gonna possibly let's just wait and enjoy these last views as they trot off and then we're gonna have to regroup and work out what we are going to do next because the rain is getting strong and I'm worried this soil that we're on is turning into a sponge so let's just drop this flap here welcome back again and what are we going to do with these? I've got an idea. Oh, that almost works. <laughs> it's always a bit of a thing finding where to put the bungee cable. That seems to work there. Let's get this one through here as well. We need them to stay quite tight, otherwise the wind blows the flaps in as we're moving. And we're not going to have the wind behind us anymore. Alright, let's go. 
So you're not going to be able to see much. You'll notice my windscreen is quite cracked. I just need to focus here to make sure we don't get stuck like that other guy did. Manual windscreen wiper. I did actually have the old blade. I don't know where it's gone. Since the gearbox got replaced recently, we re left in quite a rush in order to get out into this area. We left camp late last night and the windscreen wiper got left behind. So it's a dishcloth for now. Okay. I think we're getting there. Yeah, we're looking good. We'll be in a good spot shortly. Just need to try and work out where in fact the wind is blowing strongest from so I can open up the easiest flap which will probably be the front flap. They're all just sitting huddled up, so that's the view you can expect to see shortly. Okay. Let's try and open up another flap for you quickly. Let's see how long that. Half oh, flapped it up. Is the one at the back having a drink out of the puddle? I think it is. There's just so much water that's already logged up on the floor. Rebecca, yes, this is an extreme safari. It's certainly the most extreme weather conditions I've ever been able to share a safari with you guys on. Sorry, I'm just gonna have to jump across the screen temporarily. <laughs> I needed to just open that up for a bit. I wonder if we're gonna be able to see like this, Manu. Can you see like that? Cool. Well then this is gonna be our, our new position. I'm gonna have to look back at you upside down in order to be able to talk to you but that kind of will work and this way the rain's just going off away from the roof and not into the car and it's actually quite comfortable just leaning forward like this you guys don't have the best view of me or my rear end but at least you can see the cheetah and we're actually getting people in to come and modify these rain covers so all these little experiments and new positions means we can modify things accordingly as and when the guys come in what I think I'm going to be able to do is just reposition us again Stevie you said you haven't seen it raining this bad and the reason why is because when it does start raining like this we usually batten down the hatches but we've managed to make a few small modifications to the roof of this vehicle which makes it easier and safer to film in the rain with but as you can see we're not quite there hence me having to hold this front flap open like this okay I've got a plan though I don't know how well it's gonna work but it'll be something for now, possibly. No. How's your view there, Manu? All good still? I wonder how much longer it's going to rain for. Because if it rains for too long, it's going to make it tricky for us to get to where we were hoping and sleeping tonight. <laughs> um, so we've got about an hour's drive from here to our hotel. And I'm worried with this crazy rain, the rivers that we need to cross may be flowing too ferociously. So we're in for an adventure a bit later on after this. We are going to 
possibly just regroup make sure we are completely watertight and catch up to the cheetah I'm hoping that we are going to be able to give you some more views of them we're going to do our best to do that but you can see it's a bit tricky so the good news is James has found a spot of sunshine somehow hard to believe he's on the other side of the river so go and enjoy the change of weather now starting to cover the trees I don't know if you can see that there that's where we were when we last saw you so we made an effort to get out of the way of the storm we came barreling down towards the south and uh, it just hasn't caught up with us just yet and I'm hoping we might just be able to skirt it but I think that that is not going to be the case we're going to drive along the road here uh, if it inevitably yeah, inevitably I think we are going to get hit, but let's just see. Everybody, I think that we must apologize to you for some buffering and offlining. I'm not sure what that means, but our internet went down for a while. And I think it's back. I'm not sure how much you heard of what my last said. The storm is heading this way, but up towards home, I see that it is dry. And I'm hoping that the storm is going to go around that way, and we're going to drive around and, and remain beautifully warm and snugly dry in there. it's not too bad I'm drenched so we're putting our rain covers on it's obviously just trickling down we stopped at the jackal den almost ready next minute our blue top blows just about off the car then we're trying to fight it in the wind and the next minute I hear David going it's coming <laughs> most dramatic thing I've ever heard all well I've heard all day and I kid you not it the rain buckets it down on us. It was crazy. It went from a drizzle to almost raindrops the size of hailstones. It was so big. Then we were fighting, trying to hold the top down. Anyways, we're in. Everything is dry. Everything is safe. Maurice is dry. Tried to make Maurice an umbrella. <laughs> it's not a very good umbrella though. I don't know how waterproof it would be seen as though it's made out of paper. Maurice, does that keep you dry? That's a hopeless umbrella. That is so embarrassing. If my mom gave me an umbrella like this, I'd be very embarrassed. I apologize. But have a little listen to the thunder. And keep an eye out on, our, on the windscreen because you'll see flashes of lightning. It's actually getting quite close now. Too nervous, just said, even though I told you that I'm petrified of lightning. Um, hopefully, it moves over quite quickly, but I'm, I'm just every now and then I'm just checking because the rain is obviously coming from the east this way. It doesn't look like it's going to get better. Hey, Killer, you're wondering how do animals cope with thunderstorms? Well, I suppose they're quite used to it, especially out here. A thunderstorm with torrential rain is um, nothing nothing really unusual for them so I don't think they're bothered by it too much uh, in South Africa what we would see is because there's are, there are a lot of trees especially in the Sabi sand and the low felt region they'll hide underneath trees put their stand up against shrubs you know obviously in the opposite direction the wind is blowing and, and seek shelter I can't see anything out in the open anymore so I don't know if the animals were able to very quickly get to shelter we saw that buffalo sitting down obviously bracing for the storm remember the animals can uh, definitely sense wet weather better than well we can we knew it was coming I didn't think it was going to come through that quickly we had a couple more minutes uh, but wow I'm just gonna watch don't take off every now and then the wind changes direction and then a little gust gets into a crevice and this whole the whole tarp and the whole everything is just gonna blow off so we'll just hold it it was so funny as I was trying to turn the back of the vehicle to the rain this all blew in and I just got swamped with water 
Now, George, you're wondering if it rains here a lot in winter. And uh, no, not necessarily. We at this time of the year, you can expect the odd um, thunderstorm to come through. However, it isn't the rainy season just yet. So, as we come into what are we in September now? So October, you typically get the first early rains. Uh, I've never been up here before, so I don't know if this is unusual. I can't imagine that it is because all the pictures that I have seen of Kenya throughout the year, normally it's quite lush like this, and it will only stay lush if you get the odd thunderstorm coming through. So we get there should be quite big rains in November. Um, I'm not sure how many mils of rain they were to expect, but in in April and May, which is the the peak of the rainy season, uh, my goodness. I, again, I don't know about Kenya. I can talk about Zambia though, and it's very similar. I mean, our lodge closed, and many of the other lodges in the Lozambezi National Park closed from the end of November, beginning of December, right through till the end of April because it becomes like a complete swamp. You cannot drive anywhere, you just sink down into the ground. The roads are completely obliterated and every season they just about have to come through and, and make new roads again. I remember doing that. We went out for a week and we spent nine hours every single day grading and um, sort of uh, redoing all the roads. So it's definitely a lot of hard work. I'm not sure how it works up here in Kenya, but just looking at the soil, uh, I reckon it would be very much swamp like and I have seen the odd sign uh, that says road closed when wet and that's again it's that clay content, con content in the soil it becomes like ice you'll slip and slide there's a lot of massive drainage, massive drainage lines all of my words are disappearing from me and you could slide into one of them you wouldn't want to turn the car over you also don't want to be off-roading too much in the rainy seasons because then you're going to damage all, all the grass so we're off-road at the moment but this is a pretty good area the ground is quite stable um, I'm not sure what the soil is like but it doesn't really look like it doesn't really I'm just trying to think, it doesn't really, really look like it will be too bad, but we'll probably try once it lets up and get back onto the road, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, no jackal den for us. They won't be out in this weather. They'll also be tucked away in their nice tunnels underground. Phew! Okay, well, we're going to just make sure all everything is um, where it should be and there's no leaks. We don't get any of the equipment wet. I'm going to send you across to Scott, who is also set up in his tent. Well, we seem to be okay for now. As for those poor cheats, though, look at this torrential downpour that they are just like us having to sit out. There's thunder and lightning in the distance. You can probably hear that. What an epic adventure. And so happy that we are being able to share this with you live from a very wet rainy but very very exciting Masai Mara oh, sorry I'm just having to reposition the old top we've just got a little corner open for you we're just giving you a little bit of a slice of a view and that's to try and keep the rest of the car dry but we got very very lucky it seems like everyone else has left the rain is slowly dying down literally as we speak so it could clear up into a beautiful evening and i think we'll be the only people with these cheats if if it does great well it definitely has died down a lot we're still not going to be able to move until it completely dries uh, dies out but at least we've got the cheetah in sight and it is slowly subsiding Madeline, you would like to know if these cheetah will still hunt if there's lightning around and I think yes they definitely will thunder lightning rain I think they would be hunting but as their behavior suggests now they don't seem very interested in hunting even though it's a great time to try and ambush prey so maybe they just are also a little bit nervous of it to be honest I've never spent time like this with cheetahs so it's possibly a first for a lot of you as well as me Usually when it rains, you seek refuge. You don't get to follow the action like we're doing now. What are they up to there, Manu? Still just chilling out. Yeah. Hi, Jeffa. You'd like to know if it's true whether 
it's the safest place to be is in a vehicle when there's lightning and I don't know if it's the safest, but I'm told it is definitely safe and that's because you're grounded by four big rubber tires. Don't go too far guys, just wait for the rain to stop. Are they looking nervous or is it just me? Ooh. I think they're looking back over their shoulder quite nervously. What is, have they turned around now? Are they coming back? Yeah, they're coming back. Ah. The plot thickens. What is happening here? Sorry, my kikoi keeps blowing in the way. Which do I need to go more backwards? Yeah. Come on, Rain. Give us a break. You've tested our new roof. Thank you for that. But now we're ready to follow these cheetah. Uh, there are still a few vehicles around. That's good news. That's actually going to de definitely help us because the more people keeping an eye on them the easier it is for us to relocate. But when we did come over this hill, it appeared like there was nobody here. Great, great stuff. So I think, is that the last one there, Mono? I think no. it, no. yeah. Hello Mr. P, you feel that rain has a calming effect on you and would like to know if it has a similar, if not the same effect on me, and yes it does, I do find rain quite peaceful, um, but the most calming weather condition for me is a very thick mist, I love misty weather, if you're in a place with beautiful big forests and oak trees, which is luckily the school that I went to, I've got fond memories of that place, and yes, therefore I do enjoy the tranquilizing feeling of rain but yes my favorite soothing effect is in misty weather interestingly enough now i think let's just carry on driving like this you're just gonna have to bear with the flap for a moment and i will decided to head into the wind for a short period it's kind of like sailing I guess I was trying to go into the wind and bear the brunt of it for a short period of time and then be able to turn off so that it's hitting the side of the tent but it's tricky because there's a few obstacles that I need to negotiate around James you'd like to know if many animals ever get killed by lightning strikes and I personally never happen from time to time there's no two ways about it but I certainly haven't heard of too many stories of it happening so I'm doing I've done quite a big roundabout I'm hoping that I'm gonna be able to get some low angles and a good angle for the vehicle Can you Okay, you got it there, Manu. Perfect. We got lucky. We're not going to have to do anything. So it's still drizzling, but it seems to have subsided quite a lot, so that's some good news. As Malaika very so elegantly strolls straight towards us. Everything is so crisp and clean after all the rain. Absolutely wonderful. Hello to Tucker, just five years old. You would like to know if cheetah are like leopards. Well, yes, they look a little bit like leopards, but they have got a different kind of spots to a leopard, and they are much thinner and faster than leopards. So, leopard are bigger, better at climbing trees. Now, I wonder if this is just some playful behavior. Or, there were a few 
Coke's hearts are beast. I mean, it's huge, huge, bro, far too big for them. But I mean, a young male like this, we've seen the two of uh, them, him and his brother, chasing buffalo. Aha, uh -huh, awesome. Chasing buffalo on one occasion. That was on one of the TV shows. Well, I'm so glad we stuck it out. It seems like the rain has completely stopped. Although this, <laughs> this flap flicking wildly was like a house pipe. No, it is still raining. Sadly, I overshot the mark there. Maybe open this one too. Thomasina, you'd like to know if cheetah like water as much as tigers do, and no, no African cats, big cats really like water. The tiger and the jaguar are quite unique to the African big cats. African big cats will only go into it as and when needed. Oh, there's an elephant in the background. <laughs> or two. What a beautiful scene. I'm battling to see what Mono's filming because I'm busy holding... things as these cheetah head off into the distance. Oh, it's just like this irritatingly small amount of drizzle now which is gonna make our lives tricky. Hello Kitty Kitty Bang Bang, you'd like to know if animals ever get rained out of their dens. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to try and get you some more views um, and just see how it goes. But we do need to regroup. I don't know what the time is. We've got a long drive ahead of us to get to the camp we're staying and we've got a few river crossings to negotiate which may be tricky after all this rain. So what we're gonna do is send you up to the mountain cam, which is mounted just outside James's migration control room, and you'll be able to enjoy some views looking down onto the Mara while we regroup, oh, while I put my wet camera away, um, and we'll be back with you guys as soon as we possibly can be. Toodle do.
everyone. <laughs> We're still sitting here trying to dry off. Now, Alice, I just wanted to quickly ask, is it raining at camp? Because I'm now panicking a little bit because I left my tent a maybe a little bit open. Jerry is fantastic. Jerry is the producer of, uh, well, for Wild Earth, and she's very kindly gone around and closed all of our tents. Jerry, the tent protector to the rescue. I thought I'd, it was so hot today, I thought I'd open up some of my uh, sort of the mesh. So we have canvas as well to waterproof the tent, and you can zip it down, and you've got like mosquito meshing. So it's quite nice, and insects can't come in, but you can still get a nice breeze. And I thought, oh, it's a good time to air the tent after a nice hot day. I was wrong. So thank you very much, Geraldine, for doing that for us. Right, so I believe there are a couple of questions about the rhinos. And I said to you, I'm very lucky. I've had some really amazing experiences with rhinos. So I thought we'd chat a little bit about them. And, and my first love for rhinos first started when I was in the Eastern Cape in, in South Africa. It's a, it's a beautiful area. Uh, naturally occurring down there is the black rhino, the same species of rhino that we saw. However, a lot of the game reserves that once were farms, where they used to farm pineapples and chicory and all these different things, and they're trying to restore them. And they've introduced white rhinos. Uh, because of all the big open areas now, from particularly the pineapple and chicory farming, it's left massive scars in the forms of open plains. Now, open plains aren't actually natural down in that part of the Eastern Cape thicket. Eastern Cape. It's the, the Albany thicket, so small evergreen shrubs, very few tree species. It's particularly dense. There's a bit of fanebos as well. Uh, riverine thickets are along the, the rivers, of course. It's quite diverse. I always tell you about how amazing the wildlife and the bird life is down there, particularly the bird life. So I'm going to tell you the story of a very famous rhino. And some of you may have heard of her. Some of you may have even watched a documentary that was made about her on on BBC and it's a rhino by the name of Tandy now when I first started working there unfortunately one night three rhinos were poached very very sad in one evening and there were white rhinos and one rhino died on the spot and uh, they actually they used um, a particular drug whether it was m99 or ketamine i'm not sure what one they would have used but those are the typical drugs that you would use to dart a rhino and a lot of the wildlife out here one of them died unfortunately uh, and when they got found, found them there were two that were alive uh, one being tandy a female and there was another male and unfortunately uh, the male managed to survive a little bit i think about a month afterwards but the way that he'd fallen uh, his leg was so badly damaged, all the nerves and things, he couldn't really walk very well. So it was um, a sort of a death caused because of the poaching. He ended up getting stuck in a, in a dam and he drowned during the night, which was very, very sad. If it wasn't for that injury in his leg, he probably would have lived because he didn't have as bad lacerations on his face. Now, of course, this is very gruesome, but I thought it's an opportunity to talk about some of the experiences that I've had um, and, and why I love, love rhinos so much. But I haven't... I've Obviously had a chance to really show them to you and tell you about how much I really like them. So very sad this one, uh, this male runner didn't make it. Now Tandy, who was the worst injured of them all, managed to pull through. I don't know how she managed to do it. It was one of the most horrific things I've ever seen in my entire life. And there, there are documentaries that a reserve called Karika Game Reserve have actually made about her. Again, it's very graphic, but if you want to see the reality of rhino poaching, I highly recommend searching for that clip and just having a watch um, about it but it's an amazing success story so she's now lost her horn completely and I have pulled up a picture I'll show you a picture of her of what she looks like now um, so anyway so she obviously underwent a lot of procedures vets got involved uh, again we don't normally get involved when the animals are harmed but if it's due to human interference such as poaching we of course jump in and rhino is a threatened species we need to try and preserve and save every last one that we can so it was very interesting to see to go out on these excursions with the vets and watching them treat her uh, it wasn't great because she didn't like helicopters as you can imagine she hid away in, in the thickets on on sort of the mountains and it was it was very difficult to try and get to her in a vehicle so often they'd have to try and chase her down with the helicopters into the open um, and this was all for her own good of course we wanted to save her so she wasn't a fan of helicopters and luckily she didn't have didn't have a negative effect with her on the vehicles because that was up one of the biggest concerns is that she's never going to want to go near another vehicle again with constantly being darted 
Well, what an incredible rhino. She's actually got a great personality. She was, she's a lovely girl. I look forward to hopefully seeing her again one day. So, she's treated. Um, no horn. Very serious bad scarring. It took about a year uh, for the wound to sort of eventually close up. And... Oh... Uh, <laughs> I'm just listening to a question. Tina, you said that this story is breaking hard. It's very sad, but it's it's a true story and it happens. And I think it's important that we look at both sides. It's great to see all the animals doing so well and, and you know, we, we try and portray how, how nice everything is. But sometimes we need to talk about these types of things in order to educate people. It's very important because there's a lot of people that don't actually know what goes on. And I think this is the perfect story because it's a success story. So she eventually healed, but not completely. As you know, we often and see rhinos or if you've watched any documentaries of rhinos we even see it with zebra animals love to scratch up against trees it's their favorite thing to do and one of her favorite things to do was to go and rub her horn up against the tree but she didn't have a horn anymore and i can imagine that the scar tissue that she had on her face must have been, been irritating at times so she'd go and she'd rub and she'd actually reopen the wound and this happened in i think this was 2000 12 that it happened if I'm not me out 2012 that this all happened and um, even to this day now she constantly has you'll see a little bit of blood coming down her face but she's okay it's fine it's just a superficial wound now it happens the skin is very sensitive in this area it's not as tough as what it used to she, she reopens that wound but it's, it's she's she's fine she's since then had two calves can you believe it that down the line um, a couple of months later she was actually uh, I think she might have been pregnant during the whole ordeal how she didn't lose the calf I'm not sure but she had a calf and she's just recently had another one I think that must be about eight months six or six or eight months old now which is unbelievable let me show you a picture of Tandy I just have to go search on the interweb I'm not going to show you any graphic images I'm going to show you a picture of Tandy and one of her youngsters okay I mean there we go so there she is so you can see she's still got a little bit of the top horn because remember they have two horns but well, that's the smaller bit but look at that other bit so that is the wound that I was telling you about that she constantly reopens but there's one of her calves I'm not sure if that was her first calf or her second calf but really really amazing and what a success story to see something like that happen but we can chat a little bit more about rhinos. I'm going to send you to Scott. He wants to say goodbye so you can all see those cheetah for one last time. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I was just opening the flap one last time so I didn't share. It's turned out to be a very, very very exciting evening to be on safari. Oh, want to zoom out? There's some lightning in the distance. Oh, that was incredible. We may see some beautiful, beautiful lightning. Go as high up as you can, Manu. Um, perfect. Let's give it a second like that and be ready to take screenshots because you could get some incredible lightning bolts. I saw a few as I was putting the flap up and Let's hope there's a few more. You can only hear the thunder arriving from those bolts now, possibly. Lots of frogs calling, bubbling casinas, which sound like little bubbles popping. So the amphibians have come alive and. from Angama, which is the camp which we are situated adjacent to, who's been here for a long time, says he has never experienced rain like this at this time of the year. So, strange but good because Kenya, the whole country has been, been going through a very, very dry spell. Now it's always a bit of a toss-up, how long do you wait for a lightning bolt? Do we wait, do we wait for a few more moments? again Come on, 
lightning. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know how well it came out. Did it look good? Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad we got at least a bolt of lightning there. And the light is dimming, so we're not going to be able to show you many more pretty shots of the cheetah. But we've had a very, very memorable afternoon with them in some very unique weather conditions. Sadly though, Manu and I do have to start what is quite a long trek towards where we're staying tonight. We're not staying at our normal camp. We're staying at another camp called Ol Shaiki. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's a wonderful camp situated alongside the Telek River. So we're going to be saying goodbye to you guys. Um, hopefully we may bump into something along the way, but we are going to drop the flaps. It is still drizzling, which means it's going to be near impossible to scan for any animals. Of course, if we do, we'll call you back. But if not, goodbye. It's been a lot of fun, and I look forward to heading... Sorry about that. The gremlins just could not wait for Scott to say goodbye. How rude. Now, I hope my story didn't sadden too many of you. Remember, as sad as what it was, what an incredible success story. She was the first rhino to ever survive a poaching incident. They never thought that she was going to be able to give birth with, the, with all the antibiotics and all the drugs that they were giving her to help um, fight infection. So it really is an absolute miracle, and she continues to live on this reserve. She a, she's a, really is a lovely rhino cow. Now, speaking of rhinos and things, I've been lucky. I've been up close to rhinos, to black rhinos, to white rhinos, uh, in the hopes to try and protect them. So a lot of the times we did game captures, especially on these smaller reserves. You'll find that with poaching, you'll have hot spots where they'll, they'll target a particular area and reserves within that area, and then they'll move on and move out. And, and this happened down in the Eastern Cape. So obviously when this started happening, they took an extra step. Not only intense anti-poaching teams like what we have in the Sabi Sabi, Stand, um, but they, they took it one step further. They actually put GPS collars on all of their rhinos so they can see where every single one of those rhinos are at any time of the day, which was really quite cool. So we obviously need to put these ankle collars on the rhinos. So rangers were able to get in, involved. It's quite a, a mission. It's obviously very risky putting an animal like rhino. It's so sensitive um, to the various drugs underneath it. Um, oh, I can't concentrate. Sorry. No, 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 it's not. Sorry, Alice. Alice is apologizing. It's the rain is so loud at the moment. And then I, when I'm trying to talk and trying to listen to a question, too much for me. But I'll continue with that. A question from No One Likes Me. How can people poach animals in a protected area? It's it's very easy, in fact. Remember, the, the fences are not there to, well, I suppose they sort of to try and to keep the people out, but they may need to try and keep the animals in. We, we try and keep them in a safe zone because of human and animal conflict constantly, and it's unfortunate that the animals always come off second best. So that's why we have these protected areas, for instance, like the Kruger National Park, the Timbavati, the Sabi Sand, all these different places in South Africa. And we're particularly good at it. If you look at the, the poaching statistics, they've actually decreased in South Africa, which I think is incredible. And it's because we have got the funding to s support s uh, intense security teams, uh, you know, to have people on the ground, to have helicopters and planes in the sky, to have night vision cameras, thermal cameras, all this sort of army tech equipment is now um, being introduced to try and protect rhinos and the other animals because it's not just rhinos that are being poached. We know that pangolin or armadillos are the most trafficked mammal of all time. They top rhino and ivory and all this type, all the rest of the animals. Lions are a new big thing at the moment. Uh, so it's of course, it, it's, it's very sad. So we try our best. So, you know, People are, we as humans, unfortunately, can be quite terrible. I mean, if you if you ask me, and we tell you this often, what is the biggest threat to an elephant and a rhino, we'll tell you straight away that it's humans. We are their biggest threat. Not a lion, not a leopard, not a clan of 50 hyenas, us as people. So we try and do our bit <clears throat> and get involved in conservation and protect them. If somebody wants to take an animal, they will. And unfortunately, a lot of people's lives get put at risk. It's a very dangerous thing. 
So we've always got to give thanks to the people who are on the ground, constantly following these animal ra- animals around, putting their lives on the live to preserve a species so that our future generations to come will have the opportunity to see these animals outside in the wild. Uh, and that's what we do. That's what we're here to do. We're here to educate. Uh, we're here to make people aware of the great things, but also to be realistic and let people know that there are terrible things that are going on. But we can only do the best that we can do. But I'm going to send you across to James. James is sitting in his tent and I wonder if he's as drenched as David and I. Uh, no, I'm not as drenched, I don't think. Uh, we managed to stay relatively dry as we put our tent on. Uh, we attached it. Yeah, I'm quite wet, but I'm certainly not drenched, no. Uh, luckily, we got under a tree just in time. I really thought we'd escape it, but it ha- certainly hasn't happened that way around at all. So here we are, in our tent. Me looking at you, you looking at me. Wondering what we're going to say to each other over the course of the next half an hour. Send us any questions of your comments. Hashtag Safari Live. Uh, YouTube, you can send us uh, your chat questions. Um, uh, while you do that, uh, interesting topics that Taylor's been discussing uh, about uh, rhino poaching, of course. I don't know what she said about rhino poaching. I'm just trying to think of a topic that we might talk about together. Perhaps uh, horse racing, for example. No, I'm not very good with horse racing. Uh, we did see some horses today, though. Uh, a line of some 15 horses walking across the Mara. And I said to Craig, Craig, look over there and he said "Eh," which was his standard response to all questions and uh, which and he meant that what he meant everyone else would have said uh, sort of oh my god look at those horses and that's what Craig meant there and uh, there were horses and they were on a horseback safari uh, were going through the Mara and I think it would be a wonderful thing to do and Taylor and I both decided we'd both like to do that Craig would you like to ride a horse through the Mara? He says, "Ah, maybe I need to learn to ride a bit better uh, first. Good. Uh, Now, Joe, you're wondering if we get fires in the Mara. Certainly not today, Joe. There won't be any fires today in the Mara. Uh, It is my firm belief that a volcano would struggle to maintain its temperature in what is going on outside today. Yes, they do get fires from time to time. And if you go onto the border between Tanzania and Kenya, which we are not going to do right now, uh, what you will see is an area that a huge swathe of land that was burned, and it's pulled the wildebeest down there. Because they have had rain there, it's turned green, the black cinders have turned green, green and uh, that has drawn the wildebeest and zebra and all the other animals down towards there. So yes, from time to time fires do come through here and red oat grass or Thermida triandra is extremely um, resistant to fire and indeed it, many people th- would describe it as what we call a fire climax species. It's a little bit outdated but basically it means that it thrives off having the moribund or dead straw-like material burnt off the top at the end of the sort or just before the rainy season begins. Which brings me to my next topic in the tent. And this is a wonderful song. I'm not going to sing it to you. Uh, it's called Uchani Obulele Buvuswang Umlilo. And it's an old Zulu saying which means Uchani Obulele, the, the dead grass, Buvuswa is woken up mumlilo by fire and it's an analogy of course to our lives where pain and fire which burns us and leaves us bereft and in some state of discomfort is actually a way uh, for us to rejuvenate and become spring green once again now we have to get on to our next topic which is going to be We could talk about the parlour state of South African politics, I don't think we'll do that. And we have a question. Liz, you want to know if I have any good rhino stories from my time as a guide like Taylor. Um, I don't know if they're as good as Taylor's. I haven't heard Taylor's rhino stories. I will tell you my very favourite rhino story if you would like to hear it. Would you? You would? Good. Excellent. Okay goes a little bit like this. Uh, There I was 
with Byron and uh, various others, Byron and the other people that were training with him. And we did a rhino walk with a chap called Solomon Mshlongo. And Solly was a very fine tracker. He has uh, unfortunately since passed on, shaken off this mortal coil. But he was a fantastic tracker and he took us into a rhino sighting. And I had these six trainees, green about the ears as they were at the time, and we tracked this rhino, we couldn't quite see exactly where it was going and then Solly found the tracks and we went around onto a termite mine and he said this thing's close, it's somewhere around here. And so we climbed up onto the termite mound and there the rhino was, not 10 meters, that's 30 feet away, just grazing peacefully, white rhino. And so we backed down slowly, very quietly, off the termite mound and we started to whisper like this and I said, shut up, don't say anything, don't breathe, hardly move, watch where you put your feet. And then I slapped Byron upside the head and I said, stop telling stupid jokes, this is not the time for it now. And I got us in amongst a bush that was sort of hanging off the side of the mound. And we all very silently crept in, one by one by one. Solly actually said, come, let's go and sit over here. And I thought, oh, it's, uh, it's going to get quite close, but that's what we did, because I trusted him completely. And there we sat, under the sort of shadow of this bush, where we knew the rhino wouldn't try and graze, because there was no grass. And I kept checking the wind with my little sock filled with ash. And the rhino came around, and there were seven of us, eight of us packed underneath this little bush and the rhino came around and he got to within probably I'd say four feet at the closest just grazing we could see his lips we could see the wrinkles on his lips and the wrinkles on his nose and we could we could actually see the dust being puffed out every time he breathed just off the top of the grass and we watched his lips grazing away and eventually he lifted his head and he looked he knew something was amiss. It was probably Byron thinking a stupid joke at the time. And then he carried on eating and moved away. And I think we probably sat underneath that bush for about half an hour afterwards, just kind of breathing, trying to appreciate what we'd just witnessed. And when people say, have you ever been in a dangerous situation or have you ever been charged? I tend to forget incidents like that because they've been so almost surreal that they become quite difficult to uh, they become quite they don't sit front of mind until you think back and you think well, that was a really amazing experience I had and that was one of them so that was my favorite rhino experience I think Liz and there may have been a number of others I'm trying to think of the first time that I saw a rhino on foot at Ngala where I first walked and every, every morning and afternoon I would go out with the head ranger who was a fantastic naturalist and still is a fantastic, fantastic naturalist and um, he was learning to track at the time and we didn't spend a huge amount of time in the vehicle we did a lot of tracking of rhino and anything else that we could find but I remember going on a rhino tracking expedition with him once and crossing I mean we must have walked I don't know, five or six kilometers, so it's not a huge distance, but it's quite far. And eventually we spotted him, and I remember the first time that, uh, we, the success of the track for the first time, if you like, and how wonderful it made me feel. And again, when people say, tell us about your bush adventures, you kind of think, well, charging animals and, you know, capers where you've had to get away from things. But it's been those small, subtle moments where you've had a kind of communion with nature that are the ones that when I stop and think about it, that I remember very clearly. And I guess the next uh, one would be the first time I tracked a rhino on my own for the first time. And it was very, a rhino is a great thing to track because it drags its feet, as I've told many of you before. And I remember that one very hot summer's afternoon, it had, had been raining, so there were lots of pans and there were bits of mud around. I walked down to a dam area with another trainee 
and then we found the track of Orion and we followed it and we weren't kind of expecting to find him we just thought we'll see if we can and slowly slowly we, we managed to track him because he'd, he'd rolled in a lot of mud and so he'd left little drops of mud all over the place and we'd go from one rubbing post and check if it was fresh or not we'd find a tick in the mud and we'd go across to the next rubbing post and check if there was a tick and then we'd kind of lose the track for a while and then we'd see where he scuffed his foot and then we'd move along a little bit and we'd see a little bit of mud dropped on the floor there and we'd move along and eventually we found him grazing uh, in the green grass of the late summer or the early summer actually and it was just the most satisfying feeling in the world now I believe that oh, I believe that uh, Siri wants to uh, Siri wants to say something to me. Oh, well, let's put her back. I'm not sure why. I don't mean Siri in my ear. Um, but but uh, many of you are hoping that Byron is uh, watching this show. I seriously doubt he is because I think he's driving back to Johannesburg. I will just tell you, I know that somebody had a little bit of a go at me on Twitter the other day because I was uh, bantering with Byron about his birds. That's right. Byron and I are very, very good friends, and the, I think my very fondest memories of the bush was that training course I did with him and the six guys that I, I trained. And I mean, I say that as though I have remained some sort of mentor to those guys. They all became, I think, far superior guides to the ones I ever was, Byron definitely. And those three months that we spent together down at Londolozi were definitely some of the fondest bush memories that I have. So anybody who thinks that I resent or don't like Byron at all, please understand that it is all in good fun. Good. Uh, well, Craig, what should we talk about now? Spiders? Oh, no. Yeah, Surfing. Right, I really like surfing, everybody. I can't surf, but I watch surfing videos from time to time on Facebook, and I find them very entertaining. I think that's all I know about surfing. You, Craig? Yeah. Not? Oh, okay, good. All right, let's head across to Taylor. Let's see if she can surf. <laughs> Did Jared just say how much he enjoys surfing? I that's an unknown fact. I can't imagine James on the surfboard. Can you imagine? Doing a hang 10 here and there. I don't know what other the surf moves are. I've never surfed a day in my life. It's something that I regret, seeing as I grew up on the coast. I find that uh, I need to put my pen down because I'm clicking it. I'm a fidgeter. Um, so I would love to learn to surf, James, but I'm too scared of sharks because if seaweed touches my foot, I'm out. I run like you've never seen anybody run through water and back onto the sand. Uh, it's uh, too terrified. So I probably wouldn't enjoy surfing because I'd be so petrified the whole time. Uh, now, we had a question from Valpine Wolf Girl, and that was, let me get a bit more comfortable here, what animal, what three animals would I like to be other than an African animal? It could, apparently it could also be a sea animal. So I was thinking about this. I think the first animal that I'd really and truly like to be is a whale, a blue whale. Imagine being so massive and also having the freedom to move around in the ocean. Imagine the things, the stories that a blue whale would be able to tell. I mean, they live for such a long time too and being able to dive to, what, a couple of thousand feet underneath the water. I'm not sure how deep they can dive, but I'm sure it's pretty far. Uh, that would be really, really amazing. And I think when you're that big, you don't really really have uh, too many predators around, again, other than humans, very sad. Uh, but I think the most accurate animal that would describe me, a non-African animal, is probably a kookaburra because of the noise that they make. I reckon I'm quite similar to them. And they're beautiful birds as well. They're really, they're, they're incredible. And then I was, I was stumped on the third one. I was thinking, David was, was we were chatting, he said, what about a polar bear? And I thought, that, uh, no, I don't know if I'd want to be a polar bear just because they're sad, very sad again. I don't know why, this rain has made me all depressed. What's wrong with me? We need some happiness here. I was about to say, the poor polar bears, uh, well, in their environments, just um, deteriorating, all the icebergs all melting, and it's, of course, very sad for them. Their habitat's to spring, that's what I was trying to say. Um, so I don't know what the third one would be. It's a tricky one. Maybe, a, no, because already it was a bird, so I could fly, I could be the kookaburra, I could make noise. What about a wolf? Hey, David? 
be pretty cool moving around. I think I'd like to maybe be a wolf as well. That could be quite nice. I actually had a timber wolf, funny story, growing up. There was a timber wolf across Ale Alaskan Malamute and his name was Branson. He was lovely. Uh, he was huge. But um, so yeah, so I think those are the animals that I'd like to be. I actually like to see wolves and I'd like to see a blue whale too. I've seen a kookaburra so I can check that off of my list. But yeah, but it's, it's amazing how the mood, or the rain, and it's dark, I can't see around me. It's making me very sad. So I'm going to think of happy things. Perhaps I shall share some jokes with you next time you come with me. Maybe we can try and have a little laugh. But let's go back across to James and reminisce about his surfing days. Yes, my surfing days. Everybody, I'm afraid we are going to have to call this drive now. Um, the rain continues to fall and there is a real fear that we're going to damage the equipment. So I'm afraid the drive is going to end 19 minutes early this evening and I do apologize for that, but we've had a beautiful time up until this point and thank you all for joining us. We would of course be joining you tomorrow, naturally. Uh, three feeds in the morning from the Mara, possibly we'll have Steph on the river cams as well and our roof is now leaking. Mercifully it doesn't uh, tend to rain here in the morning, it tends to only be in the afternoon, that's very distressing. Okay everybody, that's going to be it from us, thank you for contributing to the drive, we will see you tomorrow at, uh, well, 7 o'clock East African time, until then, bye bye. Mm -hmm.